Welcome everybody. We are here outside Boston Police Headquarters, um, the second floor of which is occupied by the Boston Regional Intelligence Center, which is your local community spy center, spying on you for the common good. I am Alex Matthews, I'm the National Chair of Restore the Fourth, um, which is a Fourth Amendment advocacy organization that we have 28 chapters around the country. Um, and is all on a shoestring, but we're trying to protect the Constitution um, in many different places around the country, and I'm honored to um, serve as their chair. The purpose of the Fourth Amendment is to identify a meaningful limitation on the power of government that they cannot conduct searches and seizures ahead of time on everybody for any reason they cannot. The Constitution says so. The warrant has to specify the person and the thing or things to be seized. And so it can't be general, it can't be everybody, it can't be all of your email, it can't be all of your phone metadata. They collect vast arrays of information on innocent Americans, some of us not so innocent, and compile what they refer to as suspicious activity reports. And in your suspicious activity report, there can be a variety of important information such as for example whether you look suspicious whether your skin is of a suspicious color whether your activities may indicate some possibility that they might one day formulate reasonable suspicion about you but not right now they're just collecting the information and holding it for up to five years with no warrant or probable cause just in case it turns out to be useful and there are thousands upon thousands of these suspicious activity reports just here in Massachusetts. Here, we are lucky because we don't just have one spy center. In Massachusetts, we get two. In California, they get six because they're especially suspiciously colored in California. Um, but here in Massachusetts, we have one right outside here. Um, and we have one in Maynard, Massachusetts to take care of the rest of the state just in case any dissent gets too vigorous in those rural parts. Um, so one run by the Boston Police, one run by the Massachusetts State Police. Fusion centers across the nation have been documented to harass peaceful activists, to harass third party voters, people who attend historically black colleges, urban explorers, graffiti artists, anyone and everybody. But the one thing that they have not done is to successfully thwart any terrorist attacks. So the whole premise on which they have obtained their funding from state governments and from the Department of Homeland Security is false. They are not here to thwart terrorist attacks, or if they are here to thwart terrorist attacks, they're incredibly bad at it. <laughs> Instead, they're just gathering array after array after array of information on you and I. We are talking about collecting a file on every possible person and then seeing later whether it's useful. We are talking about the movements that you make in your car because automated license plate information is in the Fusion Center databases. We are talking about all sorts of information being gathered in and a very non-public process to, for finding out whether your information is in there, what they're planning to do with it, and an utter lack of any transparency. The Fusion Center in Maynard, Massachusetts tells as its great big success to legislators the following case is the case of a man named Travis. Travis lived in Arlington and he and on July 4th of this year when people when law enforcement was kind of nervous um, he tweeted about something that was being done for George Orwell's birthday which was the putting of party hats on surveillance cameras and he his tweet ran putting party hats on surveillance cameras good something else was better and then shooting status who in place surveillance cameras best was this a smart thing to do no i think we can all agree it was not a smart thing to do but the state of the police state is that we have is such that within two hours there were 12 heavily armed men in his yard 
the Fusion Centre is citing this as their great example of we have thwarted a terrible, terrible he thing. But he us. wasn't planning anything. He wasn't going to do anything. There's no evidence he ever was. If that is the best single example that they can do of why they are useful, then that is proof of why they are not and why they need to be shut down. So yeah. we are calling for the spy centers to be shut down. We, people in LA, people in DC, people in Oakland, people in Dallas, people in Charlotte, all across this country on April 10th, we have rallies around the country and events around the country to down. tell people about the spy centers and why this stuff needs to end now. Woo. Today we have journalist Chris Farone from The Dig Hi Chris, Hi. who has written on Fusion Centers yeah. and who can tell us a little more about it. So thanks Chris for coming today. Thanks for having me. Uh, as I think I said last time I was here, I'm, and I'm a journalist, I don't typically speak out like this. I, uh, a different kind of activism that I generally practice, but it seems like I'm here as a citizen and a journalist. The brick comes into an un inordinate number of stories that I report and they somehow up there. The first time I encountered them was uh, I was covering how they st the state of Massachusetts had started locking up graffiti artists for long sentences. And they'd come up with a, well, I'd almost say a pretty clever way to do it in that they devised a system where that if, if one tag showed up somewhere that they could match those across, uh, uh, across cities and, and, and town lines. You know, this is a major apparatus that we needed to do this, and at the time, you know, this is this is years ago. This is probably 2008. And it really blew me away. Only come to find out later, it was it, you know, this was an anti-terrorism task force that was doing this. This was this is how they were spending their time. Sure, it was an impressive. Uh, they sure locked up a whole bunch of graffiti artists uh, for nonviolent crime, and uh, those those were resources. And what I wanted to talk about a little bit was just resources and priorities. Um, of the Boston Police Department and uh, of the brick in particular, it blew me away to see you know what was being documented as suspicious activity, the people they were watching, and uh, you know years later, you know, a lot of not a lot of people like to talk about this. Well, our, one of our local heroes, Carlos Arredondo, uh, who I, I know I'm pretty sure that everybody sitting standing around here uh, is familiar with him, not just from his heroic actions last April 15th finish line of the Boston Marathon, but of course from his presence in Occupy Boston, his presence in the protest community for many, many years, and of course his yeah. wife, uh, Melita, uh, just amazing people and you know there wasn't really much attention paid to them by the public media, by the media at least, until the, uh, until the bombings, but it turns out that there actually was some attention being paid to them. Uh, Carlos had been arrested on the day of, uh, of Ted Kennedy's funeral for, you know, being caught up in a, a raucous moment and uh, certainly not doing anything that warrants his arrest. Charges were later dropped, and his, and his wife had been being watched by the Boston Police Department. We have it right there in the report, and you know, it really blows me away. You know, as a journalist here speaking, I'll say that you know, different publications and news outlets can report on this, can report on Carlos over and over and over and fail to acknowledge this ironic twist that resources had been spent, you know, following peace activists in the greater Boston area. So I think it's, it, it, it can be a bit, it can be a slippery slope to link this, uh, this lapse in judgment and how resources are uh, used to connect that directly to what happened last April. At the same time, we can say that this is what they clearly weren't doing, doing, and this is what they were doing. Okay. I want to keep my remarks super short, um, and I just want to talk about uh, briefly how the how the brick sees itself, how the Fusion Center for Intelligence and Analysis sees itself, um, and how the ACLU sees it, and then kind of how we got here. It's it's just a very quick talk. Um, certainly the questions Alex asked, you know, uh, does the intelligence community, uh, com does the intelligence community discriminate based on race? Absolutely. Ethnicity, creed, religion? Absolutely. 
does it work? Does it actually demonstrate the value that was proposed when some of these uh, intelligence assets were created, when some of these information sharing processes were created? Absolutely not. We know for a fact that we have not yet met the threshold for excellence, <laughs> excellence. Um, that was proposed when these, uh, when these organizations were established, funded, grown, um, and planted in our backyards. Let's just start with how, uh, after the Boston bombing, um, the president of, of the local uh, National Fusion Center, or the, actually the federal level National Fusion Center, described the, the work here. As president of the National Fusion Center Association, I want to tell the nation about the hard work that our fusion centers do every day to protect citizens across the United States. Usually in the background, the dedicated men and women who work in fusion centers are always ready to surge to support a crisis. And last week reminded us all of the continued threats and need for fusion centers. And isn't that just so descriptive wow. of how we got here? They're working very hard. They're working in the background. They're ready. They're ready to surge in the case of need, but really there's never any need. There's a consistent background level analysis of American citizens. Ordinary people. Ordinary people. And how did we get here? Well, the last sentence uh, last week reminded us of the continued threats and need for Fusion Center. We got here through fear. He's not saying we can do anything to prevent this work. That was the original claim. Once the actual threats came to bear on our society, the end result was, well, okay, well, we can scramble to help, but any police or intelligence organization can scramble to help. The, the, the fact is that this enormous expenditure of time and resources um, didn't meaningfully impact the, uh, the security of our country um, or really the, uh, the rebound of our region in the face of that attack or any attack. Now let's talk about how the ACLU talks about the break. In November 2007, the American Civil Liberties Union issued its first report on intelligence fusion centers, warning that these rapidly developing multi-jurisdictional spying centers lacked clear guidelines or sufficient oversight and posed a severe risk to American civil liberties. By 2012, congressional investigators agreed, finding that fusion center personnel produced, quote, intelligence of uneven quality, oftentimes shoddy, rarely timely, sometimes endangering citizens' civil liberties and Privacy Act protections, occasionally taking, uh, taken from already published public sources, and more often than not, unrelated to terrorism. That's pretty damning stuff. The point is that when there's not an emergency, there's still analysis, and who's being analysis, uh, analyzed were being analyzed. Some of the research is looking at free speech activists like you and like me. And I just want to say in closing that in particular, it is that type of pressure, it's that type of government operation, it's that that is the best and most evident hallmark of tyranny. It is a uniquely un-American and anti-American activity. When we talk about Syria, we talk about Mubarak in Egypt, when we talk about tyranny in East Asia and any military junta, when we talk about our political enemies or our political interlocutors, and we say those people aren't like us, they don't have what we have, we say that they do this stuff. We say that they do this kind of thing, that they put this kind of pressure on their freedom of speech activists, and that freedom of speech is a fundamental right in our society, in our American society, and in this time in history. We can't be using these resources to spy on activists, but really we can't be using these resources to trump up the type of uh, safety and security threat that exists. It's true that there will always be uh, uh, security risks, and it's also true that we should have the apparatus to deal with those risks, but we can't pretend like we're dealing with the risks on one hand and then use those resources to apprehend graffiti artists or to coordinate attacks uh, against peace activists or to, um, as uh, Chris Farone said, do background checks on medical marijuana. This is not just a free resource for unlimited administrative work. This was ostensibly for our safety. That's not how it panned out. It's evident, I think, in what the ACLU put together and in what the congressional investigators have put together that it is unfair and it's unsafe um, as a uh, uh, as a distinction or as a hallmark of where we've come.
I'll just say by, by way of closing that one fundamental fact remains. We never agreed to trade liberty for security. And in the end, that means that these centers only exist because they were rushed into being. And they were rushed into being during a time of fear and over and above the objections of hard workers who protect human rights, civil liberties, and the real safety and security um, that we depend on uh, intellectually and morally. If you found our reporting valuable and you want to support us, please like and share our content. Follow Bay State Examiner on Facebook and BS Examiner on Twitter, and stop by baystateexaminer.com. If you want to support more of our reporting, please consider donating to us directly. A link to our donation page is in the description. Thanks.